there is an indefinable, mysterious power that pervades everything. I feel it, though I do not see it. It is this unseen power which makes itself felt and yet defies all truth because it is so unlike all that I perceive through my senses. It transcends the senses. Even in ordinary affairs, we know that people do not know who rules or why and how they rule. And yet, they know that there is a power that certainly rules. There is an unalterable law governing everything and every being that exists or lives. It is not a blind law, for no blind law can govern the conduct of the living being. That law, then, which governs all life is called law and the law giver are one. Hence I gather that God is life, truth, light. He is love. He is the supreme good. of Mahatma Gandhi are enshrined here. The title Mahatma, as you undoubtedly know, means the great soul or saint. Gandhi accepted the honor reluctantly. He once said of himself, men say I am a saint, losing myself in politics. The fact is, I am a politician trying my hardest to be a saint. In his lifetime, many politicians thought him far from saintly. Winston Churchill once called him a seditious, half-naked faker. John Gunther, however, observed that Gandhi is an incredible combination of Jesus, Tammany Hall, and your father, and predicted rightly that in India he would be worshipped as a god when he died. His message of non-violence and love of truth, of course, has no, no national boundaries. He was too religious to serve either one nation or one religion. His religion was humanity. A fighter without a sword, he considered he fought three great battles, one with the British, one with himself, and one with India.
questions. Solve the solutions of complex things. Atom and sack of soybean, sitting cross-legged deep meditation, inflicting self-physical abuse in the search of a path of knowledge. But these extremes in the marketplaces of great cities did not provide India's real faith. For that, you must look deep into the well of India, in her cottages and huts, in the villages where 85% of India lives and dies, said Gandhi. I said to myself, you friends have seen not the real India. Bombay, Madras, Calcutta, Lahore, all these are big cities. That if you really want to see India as it is, you have to find it in a hungry cottage, in a humble, hungry home. Of uh, such villages are 700,000. And then I said to myself, if these friends who are were not finding their true India, what will they have come?
British were in India, but seldom are in India. Keepers of stimulated the desire for liberation. There were a few reforms, but most of the Indians had all the Indians as untouchables. When they did it all, it was only the lovely princess, thus hardly the bishop's bastard. There were some 584 princes, rajas, and maharajas who paraded their wealth in opulent splendor with meek and bread
If you go to the second round table conference, uh, will you go attired in native Indian dress or will you prefer European dress? I should certainly not be found in European dress. And if the weather permitted, I should uh, present myself exactly as I am today. Yes. And if the King of England invited you to uh, dinner at Buckingham Palace, you would go in your customary Indian dress. In any other dress, dress I should be uh, most discourteous to him, because I should be artificial. If England does not grant your demand, are you prepared to return to jail again? I am always prepared to the present to be <laughs> uh, Would you be prepared to die in the cause of India's independence?
arrived in England, the press found him fascinating and sometimes humorous copy. He explained his dress by saying, you wear a plus form. I'm asked about what he would wear. regard myself as a soldier, though a soldier of peace. Moi, je me considère comme un soldat, quand même un soldat de la paix. I know the value of discipline and truth. Je sais très bien la valeur de la discipline et de la vérité. I must ask you to believe me when I say that I have never made a statement of this description, that the masses of India, if it became necessary, would resort to violence. En attendant, laissez-moi vous dire que je n'ai jamais dit que les masses de l'Inde, si c'était nécessaire, recourraient à la violence. I regard myself as incapable in my lucid moments of having, uh, of making a statement of this character. It is complete independence that we want. In Rome, he spent ten minutes with Mussolini, who he said had the eyes of a cat. And all the fascists put on the show for him, he was most impressed by his visit to the Vatican, where he stood before Christ on the cross in the Sistine Chapel and wept. The Pope refused to see him. About his religion, he said, all faiths constitute a revelation of truth. All are imperfect and liable to all. As for me, I'm a Christian, a Hindu, a Muslim, and a Jew. It was time to leave. The world outside of India was having its last look at Gandhi, who remarked about the beauty of Europe, saying, true beauty consists in purity of heart.
I do not think that I should apologize to you for having to speak in a foreign tongue. I wonder if this loudspeaker carries my voice to the farthest end of this vast audience. All of you put your hearts together, not merely your heads, but hearts together if you want to, to give a message appealing to the West. It must be a message of love. It must be a message of truth. Gandhi knew well that you cannot live on love alone. And when the British ordered new measures to produce caste and religious conflict, he told them, I have to resist your decision with my life. The only way I can do it is by declaring a perpetual fast unto death. It was a fast against outside rule and against internal wrongs amongst the Indians. His agony gave vicarious pain to his followers who knew they could not kill the man they considered to be God's messenger on earth. And now, all India knew his death was possible at any moment. And all India waited and prayed. Little by little, with profound patience, Gandhi got his way. He lay on the brink of death when both the British and the Hindus promised to reform. Just why did he fast many times? Gandhi had a compelling need to communicate with the hearts of men, and he had a rare genius of finding a way to the heart, a means to reach the inner man. He had to communicate with millions of people who were illiterate, and only a few of whom even had radios. Fasting was a kind of communication, a way of reaching people. Although Gandhi was no mystic himself, he affected others mystically. Gandhi's relationship to the multitudes was not based on logic. It was a highly emotional experience. To them, he was the Mahatma, the great soul, a part of God on earth. And to prolong his suffering was an evil. And so each Hindu became personally responsible for his life. As for the British, Gandhi baffled them. They did not know how to deal with him, but knew they could not govern India without him. The meaning, that is the emotional meaning of Gandhi, escaped them, but they could not escape his power over the people. Churchill had boasted, I have not become the king's first minister in order to preside at the liquidation of the British Empire. He understood that if England's hold on India fumbled, the empire would crumble. And eventually, of course, it did. The Second World War left England weak and introduced a Labour government committed to the independence Gandhi had fought for. 
And now it is time for the last act and a tragic victory. leader of 100 million Muslims. If we are to have independence, Jinnah and his followers said, give us a separate country for Muslims. Great debate was spreading across the subcontinent. Violence was in the air. Body politics was beating its empires. One Muslim, one Hindu, and civil war was possible. Finally, what Gandhi called a spiritual disaster was to take place. Partition was now a matter of details. Certain border provinces could go one way or the other. For the masses, it was a mass of confusion. The weave of history had left behind a complex pattern. And Muslim and Hindu, although strangers to each other's faith, were neighbors to each other's lives. And their destinies, apparently, were being shuffled by distant hands, turning lifetime inhabitants on their own soil. The British gate of power was now to be opened. The flag of empire lowered to half mast. And it was up to Mount Batten, who confessed later he opposed partition, to announce the independence of two nations, not one. I have faith in the future of India, and I'm proud to be with you all at this momentous time. May your decisions be wisely guided and may they be carried out in the peaceful and friendly spirit of the Gandhi Jinnah appeal. August 15, 1947. Day of rejoicing for most. The Indian tribe held it now instead of the Union. One man is not present. He said, I cannot participate in this event. Thirty-two years of work have come to an glorious end.
is dignified for treat, even though both newly independent nations are staying lingered by what is now known as a commonwealth. neighbor, Hindu against Muslim, Muslim against Sikh. Hate is now a hero in an unholy war that takes half a million lives. Leaders of the new nation find that they too are not immune from the poison of prejudice. boundaries of a bisected nation become the roads for refugees. Lonely, lost, frightened and the frantic flee. Fifteen million people take part in the mightiest migration in history. India receives nine million, Pakistan six million. refuses to take part in government, Gandhi tries to make peace. He insists on reading from the Koran and uses the Muslim word for God, thus agitating some Hindu people. But, says Gandhi, there are as many religions as there are men and women. Make fasts, lectures, preaches, and prays. What had one man's life and death meant? When he died, Gandhi was a private citizen without wealth or property. He had no official title or post, no academic distinction or scientific achievement or artistic gift. He stated his profession once to a British court as farmer and weaver, and yet men of power. Governments with huge armies paid homage to this humble man in a loincloth. Why? Perhaps the reason can be found in some of the tributes to him. General George C. Marshall, then Secretary of State, said, Mahatma Gandhi was the spokesman for the conscience of all mankind. Philip Noel Baker, the British representative of the United Nations, praised the man who fought Britain as the friend of the poorest, the loneliest, and the lost, and predicted wisely that Gandhi's greatest achievements are still to come. His violent death put an end to violence in a divided country. His message and method of nonviolence have been an inspiration to those who seek equality everywhere, in the United States and elsewhere. Gandhi loved life and wanted to live, but through the readiness to die, he recovered the capacity to love and serve, and therein lay happiness. His life was an act of faith. He 
never lost faith in God or people, even though his people sometimes lost faith in him. Perhaps the shock and sorrow that followed his death prove to us again that we still respect sainthood, even though we cannot understand it. His life was a reminder to all of us of our own inadequacies. He was something too rare in a world that desperately needs his rare quality. A pair of gold-rimmed bifocals, an oversized watch, simple sandals that had carried him across the towns and villages of India, the total physical possessions of a lifetime, the books of knowledge of his philosophy and experiments with truth. All of life is an experiment, he had said. And now, the last experiment was ended. The nation wept, partly from shock, partly from shame. They were hurt that hatred ended the life of a man of peace and shot by one of his own people. In life, he had avoided their worship of him. The train of five third-class characters moved slowly from New Delhi to the sea with his ashes. He had always traveled with the poor, but now by the millions, they bowed reverently, tossed garlands, waved a last goodbye. Thank you. 
ever time there is underlying all that change a living power that is changeless, that holds all together, that creates, dissolves and recreates. That informing power of spirit is God. I can see that in the midst of death, life persists. In the midst of untruth, truth persists. In the midst of darkness, light persists. Hence I gather that God is life, truth, light. He is love. He is the supreme good. And so the ashes of the